I'm really thrilled about this presentation. Uh, Emily Lysons here today to teach us about the basics of composting as well as the different types of composting. So with worms, with bins, with piles. In addition, she'll teach us what can be composted. Uh, if we want to know how to use compost, that will be covered as well as composting in Douglas County. Emily is the new director for the Lawrence Farmers Market, a federal grant funded position to increase participation in our local food system and find a permanent location for the market. Her BS in environmental sciences is from Drake University, focusing on food production after graduation. She learned from experts in Australia and Kansas. She moved to Washington to teach gardening and composting to kids. Um, she there she received her Master Composter Soil Builder certification from Tilt Alliance and began educating people at farmers markets about waste sorting as a part of the city's rollout of municipal compacting in Brooklyn in 2016. She helped run the composting committee at our local community garden and educated her community house in sorting waste properly. Emily's passion for compounding, she saves freezers full of food waste for her parents' compost pile. In Brooklyn, she walked four gallons of food waste, 20 minutes to a local drop-off site, saved food scraps from Kansas to Washington rather than throwing them away. So you get some idea of how committed she is to this. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, I definitely um, road trip from uh, Kansas to Washington and carried a little container with me the whole way and dropped it off in my compost bin in Washington. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, so we're gonna start off with kind of what is compost? So it's, you know, it's basically recycling of organic materials. And so what we wanna do is it gives products a second life and it reduces um, sending that waste to the landfill and therefore um, saving it from anaerobic decomposition. So even if you take your food scraps and you throw it in your trash and that goes to the landfill, even if it's an organic matter, it's gonna be still so contained in that trash bag. And so it'll break down anaerobically. And what we wanna do is try and figure out a way to you know, recycle that back to the earth. And so the concept of compost is taking your carbons and your nitrogens, which we're gonna call your browns and your greens and combine those together. So our browns are our carbons. They are the dry or dead material that adds bulk to your compost. And the greens, our nitrogens, have high water content and were the once recently alive like plants. So our carbon acts as both an energy source for microbial organisms and as a basic building block in the composition of a microbial cells. Our, our nitrogen part of our compost is a crucial component of the proteins, amino acids, enzymes, and DNA necessary for cell growth and function. So our compost is a combination of our greens and our browns, and that's what the basic of, comp of compost is. So what is compost? It is decomposition. Basically, compost happens. Without human intervention, rot will happen. Decomposition happens regardless of humans being around. What would happen if decomposition didn't happen? There would be you know, bodies and things lying everywhere. I would just be having big piles of stuff, right? And so decomposition helps us take things that are, were once alive and then bring it back to the earth and Everything, everything is going to die and everything is going to have a life cycle. So um, with human manipulation, we can influence the rate of decomposition and the quality of that end product. Um, the way that, we, that, that, does, that happens is through fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. So here you can see um, 
a food web of the of a compost bin. And so we start off at the bottom there with our organic residues, all of our organic things that are going to break down our plants. And if you're out in nature or if you have an industrial compost bin, it'll be animal products as well. And so with that, you can see it breaks it. There's four different things that are helping to break down and decompose those materials. So we have um, invertebrates like your worms, your snails, your millipedes, your um, different little, like I see like isopods on there. There's springtails. There's lots, all the bugs and things like that, that you're going to see alive and moving around in your compost bin. Those are the invertebrates. And then there's bacteria, both there's um, anaerobic bacteria and aerobic bacteria that will break down and fungus. All three of those work together. We call those the FBI, the fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. And if any of you work with me in the Junior Master Gardeners program, we will sing that song for sure this coming <laughs> fall as, uh, I, as I love doing uh, songs with my kids. So, um, yeah, so those things are, are what are going to help break down. And those you'll see in your compost bin or in compost whenever you're looking at it. The fungus is often, um, you know, you'll, you'll see the white threads throughout it. The bacteria, you're not going to see. And then the invertebrates, they're kind of everywhere. All right. So those are, that's kind of the basics of like what is compost and how does it happen? It's going to happen regardless if we are involved or not. But how do we make it happen how we want it to? How do we make it happen at the speed we want it to and the product, the end product being what we want? So the, the first part about that is the size of your pile. So you need to start to think about, you know, what what am I composting? Am I just doing food scraps? Do I have a giant yard? Do I have multiple acres? So you're going to want to think about, um, you know, what, si what size you need, what is going to work best for you, and what, how, what amount of stuff that you are adding to it. And so there's a couple different things that you can do, and the size is going to determine how fast things move and there's two big options also, a hot or cold compost. Cold compost is going to go slower. Hot compost will go faster. So you can kind of, depending on the size of what you're doing, it'll break down anywhere from two weeks to a year. So if you have a cold compost pile and it's a giant, you know, just big pile, if you have like a lot of property, you can just leave that and it will take, you know, about a year to break down into a good usable substance. If you have a small amount and you have a worm bin and it's going to get really hot and you're going to be turning it a lot, then, you know, you can get compost, a good product in about two weeks. So with your hot compost pile, it takes about, if you're like out in the backyard, it can be about six weeks. This, the like perfect size of a pile, if you're doing in your backyard, they like to say is three, three feet by three feet by three feet. And that is like the perfect size for air circulation, moisture, and heat. So you can see I have on the slide the main part of comp. The, there are five things about compost. Your browns and your greens, like I talked about, you have your, um, your carbons, your nitrogens, and then water, air, and time. And so that's, that's like the basic recipe for compost. And so what you're going to want to do is, um, you know, if you're making that perfect pile, um, then um, it'll allow for the right amount of air circulation and like insulation to keep things hot and moist enough. And as you're, as you're adding those things together, the, um, the, like the best thing to do, in my opinion, is to add, if you're going to start a brand new bin, and you're just, or a brand new pile, is to put down like the, your larger things first, because you want to have aeration to be able to have things come up from the bottom or from the sides, depending on how you're doing it. So laying down sticks and larger, larger branches, but if are at the bottom, if you're going to do it a big pile, 
And then you want to do a big layer of browns and then greens and then start to do browns and greens and browns and greens. And like that can look like two parts of leaves or two parts brown to one part veggie scraps or one part greens. And so our greens can be anywhere from, uh, you know, like I said, it was like fr freshly dead things, freshly cut things. So your um, weeds that you want to put in there, maybe not noxious weeds, we'll go over yes versus no things um, in a bit. But veggie scraps are the best thing for your greens. Um, also, many people use manure um, at, and at, to add in if you have chickens or if you have horses, things like that. And um, even though that is often a brown looking product, it is a, considered a green um, because of the high nitrogen content to it. Coffee grounds, also a brown thing, is going to be considered a green as well. Um, so the, like I said, the large particles that you're going to have at the bottom, maybe uh, you start off with, are going to help add and enhance aeration. So you want to be able to have, like, just like how we have in our soil, when we want to have different size particles that allow airflow for our roots and things like that, we want to allow airflow for our compost as well, because it's its own little ecosystem. Um, so um, like you can add chopped branches, wood chips, corn cobs, um, things like that will help add that like bulk things. In general, you want to increase your surface area to allow um, decomposers to be able to get in there and break down all of your ingredients for your compost. And so it, you want to be able to, you want to chop up things. So depending on the size of your pile, your bin, whatever you're doing, you want to have things be as small as it works out for you. And once again, that kind of goes back to um, what you're going to be composting and what works out for your household. Um, I, I have a yard, but currently I just compost using a worm bin. And so that for me is, it works out really well. I live by myself um, and I can compost things pretty fast with it. Um, you know, as, as depending on your size of your household and how far away you want to move and how much work you want to do, that's where you start to level up higher and higher. And so if you have, you know, a, a backyard, um, you can add into like a larger, a larger bin but you're also gonna have to start to turn things a little bit more. And we'll get into that here shortly. Let's see. So, next. so we're gonna go into the yes and no of compost. Um, things that you can compost are, and this is mostly just for backyard compost. So currently we don't have a, you know, an industrial compost facility happening yet as far as it goes for food scraps. We'll, and we'll talk about what the city and the county have available for us as far as yard waste. Um, so um, food scraps are wonderful and they are, you know, they're super nitrogen rich and they're gonna break down really fast and create a lot of heat. Um, we currently do not accept those um, for the county in, the, in your yard waste bin. Um, we will hopefully be moving forward with some type of, um, municipal composting situation for food scraps. Um, so we want to, the things that we can compost are plant-based food scraps, sticks, grass, leaves, and eggshells are one of the non-plant-based uh, things that we kind of um, make exceptions for. And when I, do, when I do worm bins, I let them dry and I grind them up so that they can, um, you know, use them, get them into their gizzards and you know, help use them as like little rocks and break that down into the calcium. So eggshells are pretty much the only animal product that um, I say yes to in compost. Also do not put that in your yard waste bin. Um, they do not want our food scraps there. And so then coffee grounds and then um, fireplace ash, it can be pretty alkaline, but it can also be really great um, addition to your compost. Um, and then the no things, are inorganic materials, plastics, 
metals, glass, stickers, um, all of those fruit stickers. Remove those before you throw that into your compost pile or you'll be sorting it out later once you add it to your garden. Um, noxious weeds, uh, it depends, you know, some weeds can, can uh, break down, depends on how hot your compost pile is going to get. Um, often I just say like, you know, if, they're, if they've gone to seed, don't include those in your compost pile. Um, poison ivy and other ivies, uh, obviously like throw those in the trash or, you know, you can put those if you have a yard waste bin. Those are things that um, our industrial compost will heat up high enough for the county. Um, I would still say throw poison ivy away, but that's my own thoughts. Um, and then plants with any insect infestations, you also want to either put into the trash and not into the county compost, ideally. Um, and plants that spread by runners, they're going to be able to live out that heat of the compost, whether that's bindweed, uh, morning glory, Bermuda grass, crabgrass, and that ivy. They're going to still spread by runners and you'll have them coming out of your compost bin. And then other things that are going to rot and, you know, and smell and attract uh, animals are dairies, meats, seafood, and pet waste, and oils. All of those things, backyard composting, are not going to be able to get hot enough and to be secure enough to keep out pests and um, to compost. Some people maybe are really good at that. Uh, and then some industrial places can do that in Seattle. Um, we were able to compost everything except for pet waste, but that's a whole separate um, type of composting is doing uh, waste product composting. And then treated wood, we also do not want to put into our compost. Um, and I know that that can be you're like, what do I do with this? Well, so that you can, you know, just figure out a way to either scrap that or find somebody that wants to use that. We want to keep out as um, our treated wood from our compost piles. So I, I talked a little bit about the different types of composters. <laughs> Which I talked about the, a little bit about the different types of composters and, and um, how they, it depends on the size of your household and the size of the amount of stuff that you're wanting to compost. Um, so the, one of the easier ones, but it also is the largest, is just making a giant pile. And so um, with a giant pile, you're going to be able to just throw everything together and leave it. And that is, is usually like, you know, if you don't have the time for it, you just have a whole bunch of product, you can just throw it together. You want to be able to have it be moist. And what I mean by moist is when you grab a, pot, a handful of compost and you squeeze it, it should be like the like a wrung out sponge. I mean, obviously that's more when it's a finished product and not when it's just decomposing matter. But making, you know, so like I said before, that two by two by, two, sorry, three by three by three pile is the ideal size for, um, for, for the, for just kind of it, it working out with uh, moisture and heat and everything like that. If you get a little bit larger than that, um, if you go to like five by five, you run the risk of, of having that anaerobic breakdown. And unless you're turning it frequently and you're watering it frequently and you're kind of checking on it a lot. Um, you can see in this picture, this, the heat coming off of the compost pile. And if you ever drive by our compost facility here in the county, you will also see, um, you know, the heat just coming off of those piles. And so, you know, we want to get our compost hot enough to be able to break down the weed seeds, be able to break down the diseases, anything that might be, um, you know, that would negatively impact our plants. So um, if, you have, you, if you have a hot compost pile, that's one that's going to, you know, like I said, going to be breaking down faster and you might be turning it more, watering it more. Um, those are going to get temperatures between 120 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And there are compost thermometers that you can take and you stick in there and you kind of keep an eye on that. And so, like I said before, it can be about six weeks to um, get a, to have a hot compost pile, break things down into a usable product. And your cold compost pile is one that you're just going to like leave a little bit more and, you know, leave it for a year and just let it break down and do its thing. And that can, that'll be anywhere from 50 to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and, it, you know, sometimes they can, they can get hotter. It just depends on the, what you're having in there. But you want to try to get that balance of that greens and brown ratio of the two-part green to one-part brown. That's like the biggest thing you want to think about because you want to be able to heat it up and it to get hot enough to break down. Yeah. Ask a Go ahead. Very sure. Hopefully, everybody can hear me um, through this. But the question is to clarify weeds. Yes. And putting weeds in, um, is it okay? It's like if it's that hot, sure. you could put weeds and runners in. Whereas maybe there'd be cautionary with the cold. Right. And also, would it be okay to put the weeds in a compost bin if it's contained? Again, mm. that there's no chance for escape from the bin. Great questions. Okay, so um, from from what I know, so things... Sure. Okay. Repeat the question. Yeah. So Sharon had said, um, can, it was a clarifying question about putting weeds into compost bins um, and putting runner plants into compost bins. And um, so I would say for as far as weeds go, I, um, as long as it's not gone to seed, I would say put your weeds into your compost. If it has gone to seed, um, you, I mean, it depends on how hot your compost is going to get in a backyard compost, you know, ideally you're going to get it hot enough to kill those weed seeds. So it just depends on, um, you know, how, how successful you believe, or you think your, your composting is going to be, um, I, you know, it ideally catch those weeds before they've gone to seed, but you know, if you, if you think you're going to be able to balance out that um that green and brown ratio enough to get it hot enough then go ahead and put in weed seeds um and as far as putting runners in there from what my research like my understanding and my education uh runners your things that are runners you don't want to put into your compost bin it you know what i was taught was that they're not it's not going to get hot enough even a hot compost to kill that runner and so i know that like i've used the black um, compost bins. They're like the uh, vertical ones and it will still come out the like bottoms and the sides and things like that. So you can always, you know, do your, try those, those crab grasses and Bermuda grasses are pretty hardy and tough and vine weeds. And, um, you know, if, if you can put those into your, uh, you know, your municipal yard waste bin, because we know that those compost bins are going to get hot enough. Those compost piles, I guess they are giant piles. Um, did that answer so, that question? Yeah, Kevin. Another, another question. Uh, you have wood ash up there. Yeah. I know there's, there's people who can keep a tremendous amount, but I also know it's very outlawed. Yeah. So is there a, an amount that you would want to limit? Because we're already pretty basic here in Kansas. Yeah, that's, I wonder if I have. Yes. So Kevin had asked. Kevin had asked, um, I had talked about the yeses and nos, and one thing I said on there was wood ash. And he had said that he'd asked how much wood ash some people put, like create a ton of wood ash. Um, and soils in Kansas are already pretty alkaline. So, um, you know, what's, what's the amount? And then, um, you know, I don't know if I have the, an, an amount, but I just know like small, small amounts is really all I've been taught is like doing a sprinkling over your compost to where it's just kind of one one thin layer and that's that was what i was taught um i don't know if i have a, a better exact ratio on that um anybody else in class <laughs> all right there's, there's people who might do it from their backyard barbecue versus their you know the whole house fireplace right yeah there's, there's a lot of ash people say you know like 
Kevin, Kevin was saying that um, there's, there's people that can produce a lot of ash and they were complaining that they threw it on their compost pile and it stopped um, it stopped decomposing. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's like, yeah, it's, you want to put just a, a thin amount. It's, it is a great addition. And for me, I like to think of all of, it's kind of like when you're eating food, you want to get all those different food groups and all those different colors. And that's going to be, you know, to, to supply your body with like the most diverse nutrients. That's how I think of the same thing with composting. I want to bring in as many different things as possible to create the like most diverse ecosystem for these animals and, and bacteria. And so what you're, you know, you're creating a little ecosystem for these decomposers to work and do all this work for you. And so bringing in as many different things as you can um, will be great. But yes, yeah, something's very limited. Black oh, Kevin asked, do I know if a hot compost pile will break down jugalone from a, wall, a black walnut leaf? That I don't know. That's a good question. Um, again, most, most of my composting education has been in Washington where we did not have black walnut. So I, I, I challenge everybody to, uh, to, to respond in the chat to Sharon and let's, as Sharon might be Googling it right now. We'll see if we can come up with that um, response. I don't know that. Um, all right, we'll move. Any other questions about um, piles or hot versus cold compost? And we're gonna move on to um, another type of composting. So a three bin compost is kind of the most basic and um, like I would say the most universal type of composting that's used aside from just having a giant pile. This, this system works really, really well um, for I'd say, you know, a, a large community garden um, or if you have a large backyard. And the way that this works is you have, um, three different bins and one is going to be your add to bin. And so you're going to be adding to this constantly layering those browns and those greens. And, um, and then once the product, once you have filled your bin up all the way, you then can um, start to move it to the next one. You want to let it decompose about halfway and then you can shovel it into the next bin. And then, so um, I did have a picture, but this one doesn't have it, where you have, it has arrows from one to two to three. And there's different systems that um, I've worked with where we've had signage up where it's like green means go, yellow means way, uh, and then red means stop. So what that means is like green means add to this bin. And so it's, but this is, works really well if you have a community garden situation, um, you know, add to this bin. Yellow means this bin is actively decomposing. Don't add to it, don't take from it. And red can mean um, don't add any more to this. And then you put this as a finished product and you can take it and put it on the garden. Um, and so that's what the three bin system works out really well. So once you get your whole finished product, like once the second bin is totally finished, then you shovel everything into the third bin and that's the bin that people can take from. And so you can see in this picture that there's those like slats on that first one. And so all of, all of those would have that as well ability. And the, that is a great way to um, keep all of your compost in that bin. I've built these with um, cinder blocks. I've built these with pallets. Um, these can just be like piles next to each other even. It really depends on like how clean you want your yard to look or, um, you know, how, how, what, what materials, I always am a big fan of using what materials you have. Um, and th this is usually um, a hot compost because you're turning it because you're, you know, actively shoveling and moving it. Um, and often these are used in community gardens where there's a lot of more activity and people um, participating in this process. Um, let's see what's next. This is kind of a really typical backyard composter. Um, my parents have one of these. 
And we have these available um, from the county and uh, we are working on, we hopefully will be able to get these free to anybody who's interested in having one of these in their backyard. Um, we will release details about that when we have more details on that. Um, so this is a really, really basic one. And um, it requires a little bit more labor than some of the other things because um, it's stationary and you'll have to like, I, I have one of these in my parents' backyard and I like to use a little like pitchfork thing to kind of turn it. Um, I, this one kind of works out in a pinch if you have nothing else and um, you just have like a lot of food scraps that you're trying to, to use up and maybe you don't have a whole lot of yard space. So the bottom there that's open, there's a door that, co that covers that. And so um, it holds everything in and then you add to the top and the, then the door would open up and you would get the finished product from the bottom. Um, this is a, a very typical one and very basic one. Um, the black plastic allows the heat from the sun to be trapped in there and heat it up. Um, often you do have to water this one, um, or at least I've had to as, and as you turn it, because, um, it's not going to get any water from, uh, from the sky and um, you wanna be able to keep the compost moist. What I don't like about this one is that uh, you kind of, as your turn, you, it, the product kind of takes a little bit longer in some ways because if you're turning it, you're not getting um, that, that product's not gonna easily just come out that bottom of the door if you're like adding to it constantly and turning. So you kind of have to maybe have multiple ones of these or, uh, be willing to sift your compost out. Um, and that's, that's, it's just a little bit um, different. So there's other one, other types of backyard composters like um, tumblers and other um, bins, like uh, even just in Seattle, we had metal trash cans that people would half bury under the ground. Um, and those are food digesters and People can also, you know, dig trenches and bury food in the ground easily that way. Um, there's a lot of different types of uh, ways to compost in your backyard. Yes, Sharon. Just a couple of questions in the chat real quick. Guys, I saw that um, pop up. Uh, a question about keeping the compost out of the sun yeah. or away from trees? So in terms of location. Sure. Oh, great question. I didn't think about that. Um, I, I like to put the, I like, to, oh yes, thank you. Sorry. Um, the question was um, where to place your compost bin in your yard. Um, do you want to put it in the sun or out of the sun, under a tree? Um, so in general, I like to say what works for you is best, but um, in the sun is great because you want your compost to be heating up. You know, you want, you want to use, use what you have. So if you have, um, a sunny spot that you don't want to plant your plant flowers, plant plants, plant food, then having, um, the sun work for you and be able to heat things up faster is going to be great. Um, under a tree will be fine. Um, you know, again, it's just going to be cooler if you have it it's going to take longer if you have it under a tree or in the shade or protected um you know a hot sunny area is going to make it heat up faster anything else sharon uh are pine needles okay Ooh, that's a great okay so um are pine needles okay to compost that's so evergreen leaves in general are going to break down a lot slower. If you have pine needles that maybe have already turned brown, that can, that can be a good addition. Just be aware that they're going to be acidic and that could change, you know, your compost pH and profile of what you're doing. Um, I would say limited use of, of fresh evergreen. I would say probably just wait to, if, if it turns brown, then you can use it. Um, just be, be cautious with it, start to experiment and, um, and see how it goes for you. Anything else? Uh, not till we get to pets. Okay, great. 
Yes. All right. Kevin has an answer. We're going to hear it and let's see. Okay. Two to four weeks, that we said. Okay, so so Kevin Kevin's answer to his question about um, black walnut trees um, leaves is that they can they can break down in compost and the jugalone that is a an inhibitor to growth. If for those of you who aren't aware of that part of of a black walnut, is that can break down in two to four weeks in a compost. And you said in the soil? Yes, in the soil it will take longer. In the soil it will take longer. Don't, don't use them as a compost and mulch. Don't use them as a mulch. Put them in your compost and they they will that will break down and, and be useful for you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Iowa State Extension. Excuse that, me. that is in the chat. <laughs> Okay. Um, so then if you have a small apartment or if you don't have a whole lot of like product and plant material to use, a, a worm bin is going to be your best friend. This, these guys um, break down things super fast and you can make them yourself. You can buy them. Um, there's a whole bunch of I, like resources out there, and I can help share that as well. Um, I really like to make my own worm bin. This one in the picture is really tiny. I tried to find a tiny picture of one. So like you can, if you have a tiny apartment, you know, you can break down your own kitchen waste as well. You don't have to have a giant compost pile in the, your backyard. And so with a worm bin, um, what, what you're doing is you're introducing um, a specific type of worm called a red wiggler, and um, they are there's two different like two different uh, species of them, and you can buy them on online or at Petco, and I'll have those resources um, listed at the end. And um, they eat about one uh, pound of food waste per one square foot per week. So you can think about how much food waste you're putting out to figure out how many, how many pounds of worms you want and how big of a bin you want. Um, so they process about half their weight in food scraps per day. And so then you, you can start to do the math on that of like what that's gonna look like for your household. And what I like to do is in this picture, you can see there's shredded newspaper as bedding. I use pretty much any paper or cardboard that I have. So pizza boxes are really great for this. Um, shredded newspaper, um, any type of Amazon box or whatever people are getting, and they they like a little they like the similar moisture content to um, finished compost, like I was talking about, where you want to have it feel like a wrung out sponge is the dampness. And so I I take newspaper, dampen, and then squeeze it out, and then use and cardboard and layer that down and then bury a food scraps layer cardboard and put my worms in there. And they're gonna you know, go through that and they're gonna create um, a finished compost product for you a lot faster than many of the other compost options. And this is great because I, I keep mine in my house. You can keep yours in your garage um, or a basement. You just need to be aware of uh, the temperature range of your worms. They don't like to get hotter than 80 degrees. They don't like to get colder than about 40 degrees. So, um, you know, think about how that can work in your life. Um, and if, if there's a rotting smell, if there's bugs, then there's some adjustments you need to be doing to your compost that it should not have a smell. It should not have um, bugs. And that's, that's specifically, sorry, like fruit flies and, thing, and flies, things like that. There are definitely going to be <laughs> bugs in there, especially if you're outside. So my, my compost bin sits inside my house, in my kitchen. There's no smell to it. There's no fruit flies around. Um, and there's different ways that you can, if you just put a layer of cardboard on top of that, um, that'll help to suppress that. And also they want us, the worms want to live in the darkness um, and they want to live in a damp, dark area. So helping to keep them um, 
you know, covered, covered is going to be helpful for that. Um, we're going to get to, okay, great. I have a worm bin here in class, um, and maybe I'll show that off towards the end um, if people want to see any of that. So then how do you know that your product is finished and how do you use it? So compost Im will improve your soil structure. It helps, it releases nutrients into the soil. It helps retain water. It helps suppress diseases and it brings aeration to the roots. So there's a couple different ways to use compost once you have that finished product. So the finished product is going to, um, it's going to be a dark, like crumbly topsoil. It's basically what it's going to look like. It's going to have a pleasant, earthy smell, and it'll be that you, as you grab it, it'll be as moist as a wrung out sponge. So you can see in this picture what it looks like. It's going to look like it's broken down. If you still see pieces of the of food waste or of plants, it's not ready yet. If it smells bad, if it smells like ammonia, it's not, it, it's not the right, and you need to start to adjust some things. If it's too wet, if it's too dry, it's, it's you know, there's a couple things that you can work on, and, and you need to, it, like I said, it needs water, it needs air, and it needs time. So those are the basic things that you need to start to adjust, and we, we'll go into that a little bit more. Um, so the three main ways uh, I like to use compost is either as a top soil, a top dressing or as a mulch, um, as a soil amendment or a soil conditioner or as a liquid fertilizer. So you, you can use it just as a mulch like you would wood chips or anything like that. And it's just going to be a lot more nutrient dense and be, be like um, be a good top dressing. You can dig it in and use it as a, an amendment to your soil whether that's before you plant or as you're planting, digging it in or um, digging a trench and putting soil down there, putting compost down there. And then you can make a liquid fertilizer. So people have maybe heard of compost tea or worm tea, things like that. So what you can do is you take your one quart of compost and you put it in some type of steeping, like a burlap bag or a tea bag of some type, and then you, you can steep it in a five gallon bucket of water for a few days. And then, um, and then once it gets to be a, a dark, rich brown color of water, then that's your compost tea. And you're going to want to also dilute that before you add that to your plants because it's going to be super potent. Um, yeah, and so those are, those are the three basic ways to use compost. Let's see. Next I have is troubleshooting. Um, so a couple of different things that, that you can come across as you're, um, as you're composting and you're creating your piles, you're creating your bin, and some issues you might have are um, you might run into animals trying to get into your compost bin, um, you know, different rats or raccoons or things like that. And so you want to make sure that you're lit if you have something that has a lid on it, make sure it's secure, use a bungee, things like that for those raccoons. If you're worried about rats or other type of rodents getting in, um, using like a mesh wire um, or, you know, even digging down and having a mesh wire down below so things aren't coming underneath. Um, those can be helpful. Uh, it depends on also, you know, where, where you're at. If you're out in the country, you're probably not going to worry as much about um, rodents and things like that getting into your compost and they'll just spread it out a little bit more. I let, when I've had chickens before, I love to let my chickens go in the compost. They basically turned it for me. They would just go in there getting bugs, things like that. And they do a great job just turning that compost. Uh, so, um, the other thing you might, the biggest thing I think mo many people run into is the anaerobic decomposition. So if your compost is smelling bad, if it smells like ammonia, then there's some things you need to adjust. It's probably too wet and you either need to add more browns or not water it as much. So it depends on, you know, what your type of compost system is and um, 
how hot it's getting. If it's getting really hot, really fast, maybe you've added in a giant clump of wet, fresh cut grass, that's going to just like stick together and just rot and, and you'll, you'll smell that. So you want to be breaking that up or maybe it's too dry and you're just like, oh, this hasn't, what's going on? Well, so you want to, you want to either water it, you want to turn it over. And so it can start to give it some air different, you know, there's a couple of different things that um, you're going to be uh, troubleshooting as you start to get used to composting and how it works for your specific yard, your specific waste products and your specific size. Um, and again, you, if you see products that are, um, if you still, if you're, if you're going into it and you still see food scraps, you still see things, um, plants not broken down, it's not ready yet. So maybe turn it again, add some more greens to make it go faster. Um, start to play around with it a little, little bit, uh, and hopefully that'll, that'll speed things up. Um, and like I said before, you can also always sift out your compost. Um, if you're, if you're starting to get a little impatient and most of it's ready, or maybe you have like a vertical bin and you, you know, you, it's all kind of mixed all together, some of your new product and your old product. Um, you know, there's, there's different things out there. You can get a screen and sift it out, or if maybe you added too much woody material and you're like, oh, this is way too big of chunks in here. Sifting it out to make a nice fine me uh, material is great. Sharon, there was questions? Yes. Um, going back to some, um, uh, a person here is concerned she's using a metal bin. Yeah. And is there any danger of transferring bad bugs or eggs, like cutworms or nematodes, to your garden beds? She's using, okay, so somebody's using a metal bin and is, uh, to compost in and is concerned about transferring nematodes and and cutworms so uh, my my understanding from that question is they're they're bringing in products from their garden composting it and then they're worried about um putting it back into their new bed or their bed next year so um i mean there is gonna be i mean i'd say it's a good question i don't know enough about nematodes i don't think i can answer the nematode part yeah, um, but um, as far as, cut, I mean, cutworms, you shouldn't have, I mean, if your compost bin is getting hot enough, and if you're getting that, like, you know, that rich product, um, and if it looks like compost, you know, if, it, if it's going to have that, that smell, that earthy smell, that look to it, that's that dark brown topsoil type look, and that moisture content to it, you should have, it should have composted enough to where you shouldn't have to worry about um, Insects, but you know, if you notice some, if you notice your weeds that have um, insect damage on it, again, ideally don't put that into your home composting bin. Put that into your city yard waste bin. Um, just um, you know, you're gonna, you could run the risk. You know, you don't know how hot it is. Get a get a compost thermometer, and you know, check that to see how hot your compost is getting to make sure that you're killing off those pests. And another question we have here is um, other suggestions for browns. Um, when there's no brown leaves left Ooh. in the lawn. Okay. And there are a couple suggestions in the chat. Great. Like papers. Awesome. That's what I was going to say. So, um, so the question is um, about browns. Is uh, What are some other browns if you don't have or you're out of leaves? Like in the summertime, we don't have all of those leaves. And not everybody thinks ahead in the fall to stockpile a ton of brown leaves for their compost bin next year. And um, we'll get to, I'm excited to hear what other people have to say, but definitely paper is your friend. Um, since I, I primarily work with kids, it's so, there's so much paper and it's so great for busy little hands. So if you have a kid in your life, have them start ripping up paper. It's super great and it's, it's really hands-on and tactile for them. But um, I use, so, Cardboard and paper um, are going to be great. I mean, I know that master gardeners learn all about lasagna mulching. And so same, same thing is going to apply that th those are going to be your great browns. Um, and some pine needles can be browns. Uh, I'm hesitant to like encourage you to, to compost pine needles. Um, I, it's just, 
it's risky, but yeah. How about newspaper? Newspaper, definitely. Um, as far as I know, as, at least the Lawrence Journal world, we use soy-based inks. So newspaper works out great. I use it all the time. Straw. Straw, yes. Straw is a great brown. Um, hay, no, because hay has seed in it, right? So yeah. Any other suggestions? Yeah, Chris. Ooh, brown coffee filters. Yeah, why not? They're they're a paper. Um, but remember the coffee grounds itself is a green. So the you know, it, there's kind of that uh you're at you're adding all that. I, I drink a lot of coffee, so I have a ton of greens. My as as Chris said in my introduction, my freezer is just filled with compost right now. It's just like but the, what I like about that um, is for my worms is um, it's already kind of, since it's frozen, it, uh, it like, it breaks it down a little bit easier for them. And so often all freezing things will like freeze those cell wells. And so then once they thaw out, it's a lot faster for the worms to eat things. And it's a lot faster. And I also can, I'll chop it up into smaller pieces. Any other questions? The chat. Sure. Um, although someone did have a suggestion about asking your neighbors for extra leaves. Ooh, ask your neighbor. <laughs> oh, some, somebody in the chat said, ask your neighbors for extra leaves. Um, I I definitely ask for newspapers uh, and and cardboard all the time. Um, it's it's pretty great. Yeah, I mean, it works out really well. Um, all right, then my last slide here is just kind of um, some resources. So currently, we only do yard waste pickup. Um, like I said, we're not, we don't have um, a food scraps um, pickup currently. And so you can get a bin from the city, I think for about $75. They're, although they're really backed up right now. Um, so you can request one and it, and then you can't get, you can't get it yet, but you can go to um, your hardware store, Cotton's or Ace and get like um, a stack of brown paper bags for about $2. And um, you put those out with your trash and the city will pick those up and take those to the compost facility. Um, and then also, so you can, you can yourself go to the compost facility. They do drop-offs um, that start at $5 for a small load. I'm not sure what a small load is. I'm just, was got that off of their website. Um, and then you can pick up um, compost or mulch. So the mulch is more just straight wood product and the compost is, um, the browns and the greens all mixed together for you and created into a nice product. And that's um, about $10 for like a giant scoop, which is about a small truck bed load. Um, so that's every Saturday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., March through mid-December. Um, and they often have like, like big event days, but they've canceled those a lot this last month, I'm guessing because of COVID. Um, but you can check them out on their website and, um, it's located just next to just, just down the street from just food and the horticulture department, like 11th and Haskell and just head across the train tracks and take a left. Um, and then, yeah, Sharon, I'm gonna put the website in the chat. Sharon's going to put the website in the chat. Oh. The, the city load days are on for September. They were canceled on June, July, August, not because of COVID, because they've had so many people come and get it. Oh, well, that's cool. Okay, so Kevin said that um, the city days are open for September, but they were canceled for the summer months because so many people were coming to get compost that um, they couldn't keep up with it. And so can you explain what the city, that event is? The first Saturday of the month, the city will man their uh, high load and that they'll scoop it for you. If you can still come and, and scoop your own pickup load, okay. it's done by hand versus having the city do it. But when the city was doing it, they, they were just going through so much, they couldn't keep up. Okay, right. so Kev, what, thank you. What Kevin said was that um, those city days, like in, in September will be, um, they, they will do, they will scoop the loads for you versus, Right now, you have to bring your own tools and your own shovels and scoop um, it for yourself. So if you're um, looking to have some of that done for you, come, come in September. If you are able-bodied um, and have tools to be able to load your own compost, you can go um, this Saturday. 
And then the next thing I have is just um, is a red little bit of red wiggler information. Just I am such a fan of worm composting. I could, probably could have done a whole lecture just on vermicomposting. Um, but I, I locally you can get your worms from Petco. They carry them and they have deliveries um, on Fridays. So just so you know uh, about that. But they um, they're pretty they're pretty affordable and they just they're such powerhouses and they work so hard. And then um, they order theirs from Uncle Jim's, and that's kind of like the main worm farm in the country that everybody orders from. And um, I've never ordered them online, but many people do. I've heard the caveat, do not order them in the height of the summer and do not order them in the height of the winter. They will freeze or they will fry. And that was somebody approached me at the farmer's market to tell me all about that. Um, yeah, I, I just recommended going to Petco to, to get them because they've been alive every time I've gone. Do yeah. your worms multiply so do you eventually have to them out. That's it. Okay. So I was asked, do the worms multiply? Yes, they do. So all worms are hermaphrodites. And so they, um, they will definitely multiply and it's, and that, that's, that's another way you can get worms is your neighbor or your friend may, might have some extra worms or you, yeah. Or you just, so I, I, if, if I get too, too many and I don't have anywhere to give, put them, I'll just put them in a compost bin. So the thing is with red wigglers is they live in like a shallower um, uh, soil horizon than earthworms. So red wigglers are an imported um, worm. They're not native. And so they live in like a shallow and then the earthworms will live below that. So if you put them outside, they're not going to survive as, as well as like an earthworm. And they, I don't know how much, how well they'll survive in Kansas winters, Kansas summers, um, but they will decompose and Turn, turn back into soil eventually. Um, but yeah, I, the, we're, the, like I said, I could do a whole thing on worms. Um, yeah, that little band that you see on a worm is when a worm is um, sexually mature enough to reproduce. And so what they do is they will line up each other and they will slide that band and onto each other to reproduce. And then the, you'll have a bunch of little eggs and it's really exciting. They're like little yellow balls. They look just like little fertilizer balls. Um, and yeah, they reproduce really fast. Um, I remember teaching my nephew last summer and we got all excited about when the worms started, had little <laughs> eggs and everything like that. I haven't, I haven't checked to see if I have any eggs, but I definitely saw some worms wrapping each other around like that this morning. Sharon. Uh, a few more questions. Go ahead. Chat popped up. One, um, chicken poop, was that green or brown? Yeah, chicken poop is a green. Um, so with manures, um, you've heard maybe people talk about um, I can't think of the right word. It's not really fermented, but like it's basically like fermented manures. It's not the right word. Cured. Is that what people say? Cured manure. I think so. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it is hot. It's like, it is, you know, it is a high nitrogen. Um, I even have information somewhere. I'm sure that I, it talks about exactly what the aged. aged. Thank you. Aged. I was like, there's a, there's a word. What is it? Um, eight, yeah, you, so you, um, manures are going to be um, a, a high nitrogen. They're going to be a green. Um, and uh, I can I have it somewhere. I have specific numbers on the different uh, manures. and But yeah, um, chicken's going to be, uh, what I like about chicken manure is often it's mixed in with straw. And so it kind of add, it, you add in that brown and it kind of decreases it's nitrogen content a little bit, but with um, like horse manure, you're gonna, and you're gonna want to let it age um, before adding it to your compost. And then another question: Is there any concerns about the city compost in terms of bugs, uh, bugs, viruses, anything we should know about the city compost? Okay, somebody asked um, about concerns about with the city compost about getting picking up that compost and are there issues with bugs or anything like that? So um, what I did read on their website is um, that they do compost their um, their ash, the ash trees. So there may be some emerald ash borer. I can't remember exactly what I read on that, on the website, but it was something about like to just be cautious because there might be emerald ash borer in there. I mean, as far as I know, ideally the city compost is, is um, you know, going to be hot enough to kill everything. I will say that I've gotten mulch from the city 
and the mulch is going to have a little bit more weed seed in it than maybe your compost is. The mulch doesn't get nearly hot enough, and I've had lots of lots of seedlings pop up from my city mulch. But the compost ideally should be, you know, they they do a really good job of tracking it, and you can look on the website and you can see um, they've been doing a lot of testing on that, and they're working on getting that hotter as well. One thing I can add to that is I know that. Um, there, there is no good big test for herbicides. So okay. There's not a concern anymore about herbicides. Okay. In the compost, and also that it does tend to be have a high pH. Okay. So Sharon had said that um, they test for herbicides, and there's no concern for herbicides in the city compost, and that they test for pH, and it tends to have a high pH. And is that just the compost or compost and mulch? Do you know? They don't okay, test the okay, they don't test the mold. Just wanted to clarify on that. Just looked at something. That's where you're more likely to find that in the lab floor as well. Because they don't do anything but chill it out. Okay. But with that said, you're not going to see it in the lab floor as much. Yeah. So Kevin had said that the mulch is where you're going to come into the issues with the emerald ash borer. And um, they don't test the mulch, it's just it's chipped up wood. Ash trees. loving plants and using their compost as a Mulcher, the compost, you be well served. Either um, sulfur will drop down the pH uh, overall. If you've got hydrangeas, I understand that they're looking for the aluminum that makes that blue color. So if you're trying to get your hydrangeas blue, use aluminum sulfate rather than sulfur to drop the pH. Okay, so Kevin was saying that if you are using city compost and you're worried about pH, that you can use sulfur to lower the pH, or if you're looking to, to make your hydrangeas blue, uh, use aluminum sulfate to help um, counterbalance that pH, that high pH that the city compost might have. All the questions here. All the questions answered. Any questions out in the, in the gallery? All right. Um, well, yeah, so if you're interested, um, either if you're online or if you're in person, if you're interested in um, one of those black vertical compost bins, um, the city, uh, the county has, is providing those to us and please reach out to us we, or we will make an announcement. We're working on getting those available to everybody that participated in this class. Great. Thank you. Oh, no. No, don't do that. Sorry. Just let me shut up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, that was great. It was great. And, you know, composting, you think you just dump things uh, in a pile. That works. So you can do that, as Emily said, but um, you can get some great stuff if you follow Emily's advice um, for your garden. It's just a great resource. So thank you. I wanted to ask Chris if she'd come back up and tell us what's coming next month. Thank you all for attending. Um, this month's um, session, and we look forward to seeing you next month. And here's Chris to tell us about it. Thanks so much, Emily. That was fabulous. John Standing, who's sitting in this very room, will tell us about Champion Trees uh, next month. And that's it. Any question? Yes, thank you all uh, for attending. Um, there was one quick message. I will let everybody know. We'll announce it on our Facebook page and on our website when there are potential bins available um, from the city. So as soon as we know, we'll make that announcement. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.